colleagues, today we are living in a strange world. We are thinking globally and we send with our smartphones in a blink of an eye messages all over the world. However, while doing so, we are just staring at the small screen a mere 30 centimeters from our noses and are hardly aware of our environment anymore. And when we look at the right picture with McDonald's latest interior design, which provides for social interaction not more space than that of a laundry drinker cabin in an old pub, then we really need to question our relationship to space. If we would look up from our smartphones, we noticed that we are constantly influenced by the space around us whether it is the natural one or the built environment of our cities. Built space and how spatial layouts are arranged influence us, influence our feelings and our reactions. Built space can intimidate us or it can amaze us. One of the most magnificent examples is the Chateau de Versailles in Paris. Not only does its splendor impress us, but when we look from above at its all over layout, with all avenues leading to it, then we start to believe that it was meant to be the center of the universe, at least from the perspective of the Sun King Ludicrous XIV. Please come in. So, how does space influence our daily lives? In his keynote speech at the Sixth Space Syntax Symposium in Istanbul, American geographer and psychologist Daniel Montello looked into the role space syntax research played in environmental psychology. He outlined how different aspects of the built environment influence human behavior. Some of the psychological mechanisms Mantello mentioned were sensory access, attention, memorability, and so on. However, Montello also criticized that important aspects such as colors, smells, and sounds, which too can trigger human reactions, they are not yet sufficiently incorporated in space syntax research. Still, Montello's paper made me wonder whether it might be possible to look at prehistoric settlements from this perspective. There are certain cultural differences in how spatial aspects influence human behavior, which are also in today's societies not yet fully understood. Added to this, archaeology Archaeology. In archaeology, we have additional filters reducing what is left from the built environment in the archaeological record. It is therefore not possible to reconstruct psychological reactions these triggers may have caused on individuals in the past. Nevertheless, we may still be able to reconstruct spatial arrangements such as building locations, and palisade alignments. Therefore, we can look at what could have been seen, where was a visitor possibly allowed to go, or what were the physical distances between inhabitants of a building or a settlement and a visitor from outside. These spatial aspects from the physical framework of what in space syntax research is called an interaction protocol. I have started mapping spatial aspects of different early Bronze Age settlements which may have caused psychological reactions such as curiosity or rejection. However, for this presentation, I would like to focus on vision fields and spatial distances as important factors in human-to-human -human interaction. 
we all know how metric distances influence the way we can make contact with others, express ourselves, or find or bring in our own identity when we think of dinner tables. It does not have to be as extreme as in this cartoon about marital problems. However, we may all, like on the small picture to the left, have been invited to a wedding party where we could barely see bride and groom at the far end of the table. As a result, we may have left the party rather disappointed. On the other hand, we may, as I do here on the right, all enjoy a casual dinner with friends but without too much protocol. For this session, I have chosen the early Bronze Age lakeside dwelling of Percy's <coughs> Sukola Show at Lake Neuchâtel in today's French speaking Switzerland. And we will simply look at how a stranger from afar may have experienced his approach to this village in its different phases. Please also notice the location of sivry les manches another village I will mention later. Corsis started out as a small settlement with an elevated central access way. At the far end were a handful of houses spending perpendicularly to it. The village was encircled by two concentric palisades. There was also a small structure next to the inner palisade, which is not seen as a normal house, but probably more as a kind of checkpoint controlling access to the living quarters. The fact that the three meter high outer palisade had no provisions for an elevated defensive position like other villages have made me wonder whether these palisades had other functions than defense. <coughs> when we follow the path of an approaching stranger coming to Corsis, it can reveal a kind of spatial configuration for interaction. The first thing a visitor may still have noticed in early Bronze Age were Neolithic men years on the terraces above the village. These may have functioned as territory markers indicating that he was actually entering property already claimed by somebody else. A stranger came also, similar to us coming to this conference, with a set of expectations about the upcoming interaction with the inhabitants. The inhabitants of Gonsis, in contrast, took hold of his view by building an outer palisade and providing a passageway. When now coming nearer, the outer palisade more and more occupied our visitor's vision field and influenced his expectations. We can find similar effects, for example, in Italian garden architecture from the Renaissance onwards. Here in this example of the Villa Cetinale near Siena, a visitor's field, vision field is repeatedly compressed and despite coming nearer to the building, it appears to actually move further away. This compression of view heightens a visitor's anticipation of the interaction to come. But back to our prehistoric settlement. Once past the outer palisade of Gorsis, our visitor's expectation of meeting somebody inside was not necessarily immediately met. His view was again blocked by a second inner palisade ring. He was possibly also intimidated by this kind of checkpoint. There was a distinct physical distance between him and his destination. And finally, space within the village had different characteristics. Large convex space suitable for different kinds of social interaction was only available on the lower beach, beach platform, while just a narrow catwalk led to the living quarters. 
we can again look at our dinner table and use a diachronic example to illustrate this effect. The Chateau Chenonceau in France has a magnificent gallery which in Rivochere. It was used for large banquets and representations. And at the far end of the table we would find Caterina de' Medici in her role as Queen of France while guests of lesser importance were sitting at the other end. Spatial distance here were very clearly indicated political power and social rank. A similar function may have applied to the elevated walkway of bronzes spanning the gap between our visitors standing at the outer palisade and the inhabitants of the village. However, is this spatial layout of our early Bronze Age village purely coincidental or are we actually allowed to expect some significance in it? Incidentally, there is indication that this particular setting had some meaning over great distance. About 150 kilometers southwest of Gorsis, we have in Sevrier Le Monche at Lake Ancy in the Savoy Alps, a contemporaneous village with a very similar layout. Both villages had a central access way, were encircled by concentric palisades, had possibly a checkpoint, and the houses were built perpendicularly to the central axis. Should it not be a pure coincidence, the spatial layout of these two villages define simultaneously a very similar protocol of interaction. When we proceed and look at the middle phase of Gonsies, we, we notice that despite being much bigger, the basic spatial configuration in the approach to the village remained the same. The fact that this layout was successfully reproduced about eight generations after the first phase and the local community even managed to expand the village leads to the conclusion of a stable ancient environment. However, this was all about to change. After the fire completely destroyed the middle phase, Corsis was rebuilt on a final and much smaller scale. We can use isovist analysis to illustrate how the previous setting was corrupted. Particularly the two palisades and the space in between had been disturbed. Instead, there was a strange kind of offset palisade exposing what was once important for interaction. What was also gone in this, is this kind of possible checkpoint at the inner palisade. This indicates that not only the interaction protocol, but also the shared label, the understanding of the inhabitants of how the village was to be organized, had changed. The idea of using psychological mechanisms in prehistoric archaeology might still be novel and strange. However, I think when we look at the overall archaeological context, it may actually make some sense. Concis <coughs> belongs to the Arivone group of the Rhone civilization, which was in its largest extension situated between modern Lyon, Lake Geneva and western Switzerland. Chronologically, we are in its advanced and late phases. In the material goods of this period, we find in western Switzerland elongated spoon-shaped bronze axes. I have illustrated the basic sequence of their development, however, the different types are chronologically slightly overlapping. Albert Hafner doubts that these objects were of any practical use other than representing wealth. He also wrote in his analysis that wealth and prestige objects need to be presented to satisfy their function. And in early Bronze Age research, we often talk about elites and their prestigious metal objects. 
to link the spatial interaction aspects we just talked about to what Hofner said, it might well be possible that we can expect similar to different royal courts of later historic periods, certain kind of interaction rituals, courtship etiquettes, or similar pattern of behavior in which spatial layouts form a kind of stage. On these stages, more wealthy parts of society may at certain occasions have shown their wealth and interacted in a more formalized way with visitors from outside. At the end of our time window, we find significant spatial changes just about uh, 1600 BC. This coincides with the proliferation of land quietances in eastern Switzerland, a type of bronze adds now far more a practical tool than just prestige object. And around Zurich, we see at the brink of Middle Bronze Age a quick proliferation of richly decorated pottery. Pottery is another means of expressing one's cultural identity and has a far greater social penetration depth than luxurious goods and space. Thank you for your attention.